Good morning and uh, good evening also to our friends uh, in Washington, D.C. And welcome to the online launch of the latest edition of the Global Economy Prospect, which is live from CCG head office here in Beijing. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We are honored and pleased to be partnering with the World Bank for the fourth time now uh, for the official launch of its Samuel Annual Flagship Report in China. Uh, I'm Henry Hui Yao Wang, founder and president of the Center for China and Globalization. And we're very pleased to be joined by a distinguished group of economists from the World Bank. Uh, Dr. Arhan Kosi, chief economist and director of the World Bank Prospect Group. Dr. Martin Razor, World Bank Country Director for China, Mongolia, and Korea. And Ms. Ekrin Vashmadizi, Senior Country Economist at World Bank's Prospect Group. Global Economic Prospect is a World Bank's uh, flagship report on global economy development and prospect with a focus on emerging markets and developing economies. It takes the pulse of economic development and trends around the world, presents and assess the topical issues in the global and regional economies and serves as an important reference for the government and business worldwide. Uh, this actually is the first time that Center for China Globalization and World Bank partnered together for the official launch of the report in China. I understand they have just launched us in Washington, D.C., and now we are the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the spot for launching this in, in China and probably in Asia as well. So, so thank our, our World Bank friend for partnering with CCG to do that. So today's discussion will be consist with mainly four parts. Uh, to begin with, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Kozi. Uh, he will outline the latest findings in the global economic perspective, and then followed by Dr. Razor uh, to share insights on China's economic situation and outlook. I mean, I know Martin has been <laughs> living in China for the last several years, I and mean, he's the country director for World Bank in China, he knows a lot about China. So as we are actually uh, coming to the Chinese New Year and looking for, uh, you know, it's time to re, re looking back and looking in the future. Uh, I think both uh, Dr. Kozi uh, on the world uh, forecast and uh, uh, review, but also Dr. Reza's forecast and review will be extremely helpful for, for the, you know, academics, policymakers, and of course, business uh, leaders in China. Uh, then we'll have, uh, uh, have some, we'll have some discussion to explore the critical issues uh, that have been or will be shaping the economic outlook of the world, uh, including the surging inflation, which we've seen, higher debt, and of course, increasing inequalities, and look at some of the major policy movement and market trends in China Chinese domestic economy. Uh, then we will have a Q&A section. Uh, we also receive some questions from media. So that will be uh, the program of, the, of, this, of this morning. So to quickly introduce our uh, uh, key uh, speakers, actually distinguished guests from World Bank today. First, I would like just to introduce briefly uh, Dr. Ahan Kosi. He's the chief economist and director of the Perspect Group in the equitable growth, finance, and institutions practice of the group of the World Bank. Uh, under his management, the Perspect Group produced the bank's corporate flagship report, Global Economic Perspect, and in addition to other policy and analytical publications. Uh, and doc, uh, Dr. Kosey previously served as acting vice president uh, of EFI and director of uh, Vice President of World Bank and the Director of the Prospect Group. And of course, prior to joining the World Bank, he was assistant to the Director of the Research Department and the Deputy Chief of Multilateral Surveillance Division in IMF. Uh, also, I'd like to uh, introduce our second speaker, Dr. Martin Kozi, is the World Bank Country Director for China and Mongolia and the Director for Korea, uh, study from March 2019. Dr. Reza is a leading is leading a team that are actually managing an evolving partnership with China, a growing program of support to Mongolia and, and deeply knowledge partnership with Korea focusing on innovation and technology. 
And uh, also we have uh, Dr. Uh, Catherine uh, Vashemizi is a senior country economist in the Prince Group in equitable growth, finance, and institution practice at, uh, group at the World Bank. I mean, she leads the macroeconomic monitoring and economic forecast group for the East Asia and the Pacific region. So, so, so uh, as we can see, I mean, we are, we are going to get into this fascinating uh, presentation by uh, Dr. Kosi. Uh, we see that, uh, you know, after rebounding to an estimated 5.5% in 2021, the new edition of your global economic prospect said they expect global growth to uh, decelerate markedly to 4.1% in 2022, and reflecting the continued global 19 uh, you know, challenges and diminish the physical support and the lingering supply bottlenecks. So perhaps uh, we, we'll let uh, Dr. Kozi to give the full picture uh, of this. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Kozi, and probably you can start. Uh, thank you, Henry, uh, and greetings from Washington, DC. Uh, uh, thank you again for inviting us and hosting us. And I'm hoping that one of these days we will be uh, organizing this event uh, in person. As you mentioned, this is the first uh, public uh, presentation of the Global Economic Prospects Report in uh, Asia. And, and we are very happy that uh, our country director, uh, Martin Reiser, is also joining us today. Uh, and I think the timing is uh, also fantastic. Uh, we just released the chat, of course, the China growth numbers came out uh, over the weekend. Uh, I am looking forward to having an excellent exchange. Uh, I have a few slides to show. Let me uh, quickly uh, move to the PowerPoint presentation. I hope you all can see the presentation now. Yes, yes, we can, yes. Uh, thank you, Henry. Uh, so, um, in this uh, report, uh, we have the usual global outlook and regional outlook chapters. Uh, in addition to these two chapters, we have three analytical chapters. One of them looks at these uh, cycles in commodity markets, the sources of these cycles, and what are the policies to take advantage of these cycles. The second one, examines the impact of the pandemic on income inequality. And the third one looks at the uh, elevated debt levels after the pandemic and how to basically address these uh, debt challenges um, in light of the experience of previous multilateral debt relief initiatives. So um, I'm uh, going to cover uh, just a little bit of what we have in the report, but I look uh, forward to uh, continue this conversation. Uh, I'm gonna structure the presentation around three questions. The first one, what are near-term growth prospects for the global economy? Uh, the second one, what are the main features of commodity price cycles? And the third one, what are the policy priorities for EMDEs, that stands for Emerging Market and Developing Economies. Let me start with the first question. What are near-term uh, growth prospects for the global economy? Now, we had, a, of course, a once in a century crisis in 2020. Uh, this was not uh, an expected crisis and it really uh, wreaked havoc around the world. After the collapse in 2020, uh, the deepest global recession we experienced over 80 years, we had a, a very sharp rebound in the global economy. As you see on the left uh, panel here, uh, in fact, uh, growth uh, registered a, a multi-decade high um, and reached five and a half percent at the global level. Now, over the next two years, we are expecting global growth to slow down. First, this year, 4.1 percent, and the next year, uh, 3.2 percent. 
these are still high numbers when you think about average global growth over the longer term. Advanced economies are going to slow and emerging market developing economies as well are going to slow in 2022 and 2023. So the first observation is that global economy is entering into a broad-based slowdown. The second observation is that this is an exceptionally steep slowdown. So we had an exceptionally uh, sharp rebound. Now we are going to see an exceptionally steep uh, downturn. What do we mean by that? On the right, what you see, the difference between the third year of the recovery and the first year of the recovery following a global recession. Uh, in the modern era, in the sense that you have all the global recessions since 1960. So what you see here in 1982 recession, global economy accelerated from 83, 84, 85. And in the 1991 recession as well, we saw an acceleration in the global economy, 92, 93, and 94. After the 1975 recession, global economy rebounded uh, in 76, but then uh, slowed down. And in 2009, of course, we had a sharp rebound and then a serious slowdown. And that slowdown, uh, of course, ended with the Euro area debt crisis. As you can see here, between 2023 and Last year, we are going to see global growth slowing by about 2.3 percentage points. And that is the sharpest slowdown uh, that's going to uh, happen, uh, at least based on our projections uh, over the past basically 60 years following a global recession. Let me quickly talk about the numbers. I already mentioned that global growth is slowing and that's a broad based and sharp slowdown. We downgraded our growth numbers at the global level for advanced economies as well as emerging market developing economies. A part of these downgrades reflect COVID waves, uh, but at the same time, there were uh, all types of idiosyncratic reasons that drove these uh, downgrades. Growth in advanced economies is gonna slow, uh, and, and we are expecting US and Euro area to slow uh, from 2021 to 2022. In the case of emerging market developing economies, we are going to go back to pre-pandemic uh, average growth rate in 2023, around 4.5%. The slowdown in emerging developing economies uh, partly reflects, of course, the slowdown uh, in China, uh, Martin will uh, discuss extensively. Uh, but even if you take out China from our emerging developing economic group, uh, growth uh, will slow significantly by about one percentage uh, point um, over the next two years. Now, uh, <clears throat> why do we see this uh, slowdown around the world? Uh, the first reason is that, of course, we uh, had this extraordinary fiscal and monetary policy support measures, and that support is now is being withdrawn. The second important reason, last year we saw strong pent-up demand, and now that demand is uh, dissipating. In the case of emerging market developing economies, as I will show later in the presentation, uh, there is uh, already underway a withdrawal of macroeconomic policy support. And the uh, external environment is going to be less favorable as well. External demand will uh, decline uh, for emerging market developing economies. Uh, trade will be weaker. 
uh, portfolio flows are already uh, quite weak. And of course, uh, financing conditions are already tightening. Now, when you look at the regions, you see that uh, Europe and Central Asia will be the region closest to it is uh, pre-pandemic uh, trajectory uh, when it comes to growth prospects. But that region, as well as Latin America and Caribbean, uh, are subject to uh, substantial downgrades in 2022 relative to our June uh, forecast. In the case of East Asia Pacific as well, we downgraded our forecast. Uh, uh, those downgrades reflect uh, downgrades in big economies in the region, including uh, China. In the case of Middle East and North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, we upgraded our forecast uh, for 2022 uh, that reflects uh, the improvements uh, in, in commodity space as well as uh, non-commodity uh, sectors. In the case of South Asia, India's economy has been doing uh, better than expected. And, and of course, that reflects the, the, in the regional aggregate. With respect to Sub-Saharan Africa, as much as we upgraded growth and we are seeing growth picking up over the next three years, by no means this growth is sufficient for the region to overcome the poverty problem. Now, while these numbers show a sharp slowdown everywhere, at the aggregate, they also mask a critical reality. And that reality is that we are going through still an uneven global recovery. So when you look at the chart on the left, what you see is that advanced economies are going to go back to their pre-pandemic trend level of output by 2023. Emerging market developed economies will be 4% below the trend, the pre-pandemic trend. In the case of small states, that number is close to 9%. So some parts of the world not recovering in the way they should recover because as much as uh, there is this recovery still underway, what you see on the right, basically, advanced economies are in this flight path and they are flying, in a sense, at a higher trajectory. In the case of investment as well, they are going to go back to their pre-pandemic trend level. But emerging market developing economies will see their uh, investment levels stabilizing 4% below the pre-pandemic trend level of investment. So these economies are flying low and there is limited gas left in their tanks in terms of policy space, as I will discuss later in the presentation. One of the chapters we have in the chat looks at the impact of the pandemic on inequality and the poverty. So on the left, we look at how inequality between countries has evolved after the global financial crisis and after the pandemic. So of course, after the global financial crisis, uh, emerging market developed economies were able to recover much faster and they did perform well. So during that period from 2008 to 2010, between country inequality has actually declined irrespective of the measure you use. During this, this crisis, the pandemic crisis, we saw an increase in inequality. And that's not surprising given this different flight trajectory, as I mentioned, advanced economies were able to basically put unprecedented amount of policy support, while that policy support was much more limited. Advanced economies were also able to, of course, put all types of measures, very strong vaccination campaigns, 
and, and were able to vaccinate their populations very fast. Uh, in the case of emerging market developing economies, they lacked, of course, because of the capacity of the health systems, as well as the, the, the insufficiency of uh, vaccines. And that inequality of vaccines is just one dimension of the pandemic when it comes to inequality. Of course, the pandemic created uh, this new class of poor after two decades of declines in poverty we saw the first increase in extreme poverty in 2020. And in the middle panel, you see that uh, how uh, without COVID, uh, we would have still uh, lower poverty relative to, of course, in 2019. But because of the COVID, the poverty rates increased in low-income countries, much more than, of course, emerging market developing economies as a whole. One other uh, aspect of the pandemic is that it affected within country income inequality. This is also not surprising. Uh, the pandemic is all about uh, the, the inequality. We saw that there were larger uh, income losses when it comes to poorer segments of the society. There were larger, basically, uh, uh, job losses when it comes to informal sector, uh, low skilled workers, and of course the uh, female members, the women uh, affected by the pandemic. And that manifested itself in within country income, income inequality as well, as you see how uh, Gini indices have changed uh, in different uh, subgroups of emerging market developing economies. So all in all, there is clear increase uh, in inequality between countries uh, during this pandemic era. There is increase in extreme poverty, and there is uh, also uh, somewhat an increase in inequality within countries as well. Against this background, uh, we also looked at the risks. Uh, risks are multiple. And uh, they point to this uh, possibility of a hard landing scenario in emerging market developing economies, primarily because of limited fiscal space and uh, tightening financial conditions in an environment. You see uh, a steep slowdown in many of these economies. The first risk, of course, is uh, the pandemic, new outbreaks, new mutations. As we see in the case of Omicron, pandemic is still with us and, and it has severe consequences for activity. I will talk about this issue soon. Uh, inflationary pressures, definitely surprise on the upside and in all likelihood, increase the, uh, the pace and magnitude of the tightening cycle in advanced economies, especially the United States. And that could translate into uh, financial stress in highly indebted emerging market developing economies. Uh, <clears throat> we are still dealing with uh, supply related uh, disruptions around the world. And those disruptions actually uh, put extra pressure on, on the prices and, and translate into larger inflationary pressures. The climate-related disasters cannot be uh, underestimated as we have seen time and again. And uh, there is this one uh, important uh, long-term risk uh, associated with, with weaker than expected growth performance when it comes to especially potential growth in emerging developing economies. Let me briefly talk about the risk associated with Omicron. Uh, as you are all following, uh, many countries have been suffering uh, this, this new wave, uh, which uh, is pretty much the largest wave we have seen so far. This uh, mutation is highly transmissible, but the, its impact on health outcomes is 
uh, much more manageable if you are vaccinated. And there is uh, this hesitancy to introduce uh, very comprehensive lockdown measures around the world. Because of that, the impact on economic activity is going to be smaller than what we saw in previous waves of the pandemic. Having said that, we might end up seeing a larger impact if the Omicron wave is more, product, more protracted and it has a larger impact, of course, on health systems and translates into larger disruptions on, uh, of course, supply side and curtail uh, demand. Under these different possibilities, uh, we looked at the impact of the Omicron wave on global growth, growth in advanced economies, and growth in emerging market developed economies. The bottom line is that relative to the baseline we have, growth can disappoint anywhere between 0.2 to 0.7 percentage points in the world, in the case of emerging market developed economies, uh, the impact of Omicron uh, is likely to be larger, uh, primarily because of the limited uh, policy space they have, as well as the uh, limited health capacity to counter the basically the health disruption associated with Omicron. So, uh, in the case of uh, Omicron, our baseline assumption is that we will see an impact in the first quarter, but given these waves uh, subside soon, the second quarter we will see an uptick and the overall impact is going to be small. Now, there are some other important risks uh, and one of them is, of course, associated with higher inflation. As I mentioned earlier, inflation uh, surprise on the upside. We have the highest inflation uh, globally and highest inflation in advanced economies since 2008. In emerging market developing economies, uh, they are exp experiencing the highest inflation in a decade. A number of emerging market developing economies have already uh, started increasing policy interest rates, as I will discuss soon. Because of that, financing conditions in these economies have been already tightening, as you see in the middle panel. Because of these inflation surprises, US interest rate expectations, these are policy rate expectations uh, by markets, have been moving up and markets are expecting a, a larger uh, interest rate uh, increase by the end of uh, 2022 and a faster uh, increase in interest rates. Of course, uh, a number of countries, uh, emerging market developing economies, have elevated debt levels. In some cases, uh, these debt levels include uh, foreign currency denominated debt, and some of these economies do not have the policy space, and they don't have the credibility in terms of their macroeconomic uh, policy frameworks. These economies are likely to be affected if we see a, a much faster uh, tightening of monetary policy conditions in advanced economies. Let me turn to the second question. Uh, what are the main features of commodity price cycles? As most of you know, commodity markets are quite important for emerging market developing economies. Almost two thirds of emerging developing economies one way or another, rely on commodity revenues uh, to basically carry out their uh, activities. As you see on the left, uh, in the case of, for example, oil, uh, oil revenues account for uh, the 60%, the, uh, in some cases, uh, up to 80% of total export revenues in emerging market developing economies. We went through a historical uh, commodity uh, boom-bust cycle in the sense that 
uh, commodity prices collapse with the arrival of uh, the pandemic in early 2022. But then uh, for most commodities, we see an up, uh, we, we see a surprising uh, uptick in prices and prices reach record levels. Uh, in fact, now uh, oil prices are seeing multi-year highs. And this is also true, uh, metal prices as well. So the pandemic global recession coincided uh, with this uh, unusually uh, the, the deep uh, downturn in commodity markets, followed by unusually sharp rebound uh, in the same year. So uh, in the chat, we look at the uh, commodity price cycles uh, over the past basically 50 years and try to understand uh, the implications of these cycles basically for the markets. When you look at the duration of these cycles, uh, booms and slumps uh, in most cases uh, have the similar duration except in the case of, for example, copper, uh, the downturns tend to be longer than boom periods. What is most surprising, uh, despite this uh, similarity in duration, booms translate into much larger increases in absolute terms than what we see the declines during uh, slumps. Uh, this is, of course, an important policy implication for commodity producers, they need to think about how they can take advantage of these windfalls during the booms, because those windfalls are quite sizable, and smooth their cycles during the kind of the slumps. Both uh, supply conditions as well as demand conditions affect uh, commodity cycles. But if you look at the kind of the movements in uh, commodity markets, they go pretty much hand in hand with uh, global uh, business cycles. As you see on the right, uh, in the case of, for example, oil, 70% of the time, uh, oil price cycle moves uh, with the uh, global industrial production cycle, meaning they are pretty much in the same phase. Let me turn to the third question. What are the policy priorities for emerging market? developing economies. There's a long uh, list of uh, priorities to basically uh, to think through. But the first priority uh, is still uh, controlling the pandemic. And that, of course, uh, require coordination to ensure equitable access to vaccines and reduce the threat of new variants. It's an important issue because in the case of uh, low-income countries, vaccination rates are still in single digits. It is going to be critical for the global community to make significant progress on this issue uh, because if we don't control the virus everywhere, uh, we will end up seeing, uh, of course, new variants and we will end up seeing new waves in unexpected places around the world, in some cases in multiple places. The second important point when it comes to policy, ensuring macroeconomic stability. This is easier said than done. Uh, many countries have to confront the problem of inflation to basically maintain price and financial stability. And that will of course require strengthening macroprudential policies. Debt problems, of course, require uh, finding ways to improve the revenue side of the government balance sheets and rebuilding the fiscal buffers to basically overcome the debt sustainability concerns. Given the kind of the new waves and the climate-related disasters we have seen repeatedly and possible financial stress we are projecting down the road, it's going to be critical to enhance crisis preparation and think through how to improve long-term growth prospects. In both cases, emerging developing economies need to find ways 
to basically undertake uh, reform initiatives, structural policy interventions, and of course, in the case of uh, commodity exporters, especially exporters of those fossil fuel uh, based commodities, reducing reliance uh, on uh, excessive reliance on commodities for fiscal and export revenues by diversifying their economies, diversifying the assets they have, including uh, human capital and the physical capital. Confronting the generational challenge of climate change and confronting this uh, challenge of inequality, given the scars associated with the pandemic, another important issue. And of course, the, the climate uh, challenge uh, got uh, a lot of attention recently with the COP26. Uh, the inequality challenge will be with us for the foreseeable future with serious uh, social uh, implications down the road. Let me quickly talk about the policy space. As you see on the left, in response to these inflationary pressures, emerging market developing economies started tightening their monetary policies. Now, uh, monetary policies in these economies uh, reach to a point uh, policy interest rates are higher than the average policy interest rate we saw uh, prior to the pandemic decade. What is the big challenge here? Uh, that many of these economies would like to control inflationary pressures to make sure uh, inflation expectations are not uh, the, the anchor. Uh, but of course, as soon as basically they employ these types of contractionary measures, uh, they are also having an impact on the recovery, as I discussed at the beginning, remains incomplete. On the fiscal policy side, emerging market developing economies employed uh, significant fiscal support, not to the extent, of course, we have seen in advanced economies uh, in 2020. But 2021, that support uh, start being withdrawn and it will continue this year and next year. So the fiscal support we saw during the pandemic uh, is going to turn into a drag uh, for these economies uh, in coming years. There is a need to do this, but it's going to be critical to implement these fiscal policies in a credible medium-term program that basically articulates how the governments are going to improve expenditure efficiency while expanding the revenue base. global community is facing a major crisis in the context of debt challenges, especially in lower income developing economies. These economies have seen a significant increase in their debt to GDP ratios, as you see on the left. Debt to revenue ratios are now around 450%. So, for many of these economies, allocating payments for debt service becoming a big challenge while they are trying to contain the health crisis and allocate resources for education, for health, and for basic public services. In the latest report, we looked at previous multilateral debt relief in initiatives such as Brady Plan, EPIC Initiative, MDRI. The lessons from these initiatives are clear. There needs to be a speedy resolution of the debt challenge, debt challenges these economies are confronted by. That requires, in some cases, outright reductions in debt. In some cases, this will require stronger global collaboration and bringing private entities to the table. Not solving these problems on time will make these problems even larger 
down the road. So the global community does not have a large menu of options available as we are going through a serious slowdown with huge consequences for development outcomes in low-income developing economies. Let me briefly talk about the climate-related issues. Emissions declined in 2020. Obviously, global economy was contracting. We were going through a recession. In 2021, emissions went up. And this year and next year will go up again. These very high emissions underscore the need for this green transition. Share of renewables in global energy supply, if you look at the total energy and if you look at the electricity supply, has been indeed increasing over time, but not fast enough and not enough at the moment that requires us in a meaningful way to respond to the climate challenge uh, we are facing. That's why for emerging developing economies, as well as advanced economies, it's going to be critical to employ policies that will translate into uh, a green, uh, equal uh, recovery. And, and that recovery uh, will hopefully uh, reverse some of the damage associated with climate change in the medium term. Let me summarize uh, what are near-term growth prospects for the global economy. We are seeing a pronounced global slowdown uh, that is underway before the recovery is complete in emerging developing economies. There are multiple downside risks. And the important risk is that the possibility of hard landing in emerging developing economies. The second question I ask, what are the main futures of commodity price cycles? Uh, these cycles uh, translate into often larger booms and slumps. Uh, and there's growing price synchronization across energy and metals, mostly because of global demand shocks. And the third important uh, question I discussed, the policy priorities. And there, again, the main priority is controlling the pandemic. But emerging market developing economies need to navigate a, a difficult environment that is basically a normalization environment when it comes to policy in advanced economies. And basically, we throw policy in a carefully uh, calibrated and credible way. Uh, let me thank you and, and uh, stop the uh, presentation here. Uh, back to you, Henry. Thank you. Yeah, OK. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kosi. Excellent. Actually, also very comprehensive and very uh, uh, timely uh, you know, presentation of your latest uh, Global Prospect uh, uh, report. And I think this is really uh, relevant uh, for, for not only uh, the, you know, the, the developing countries, you know, particularly uh, emerging market and, uh, and developing economies, but also to the developed world as well. So I think this is really great. And you have also mentioned a lot of uh, uh, policy uh, recommendations for how we tackle uh, you know, this pandemic and, and the global uh, possible recession and also those debt and, uh, and the supply chain issues. So, so it's really great. And we, we need to digest that. We, uh, we actually had a, a live broadcasting with a simultaneous uh, uh, interpretation in Chinese. So, so I'm sure uh, this will add on your detailed uh, report, uh, which give a lot of uh, uh, in-depth uh, discussion. Uh, now on, on China, so 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 we know that uh, uh, Chinese economy is uh, is still doing uh, pretty well. I mean, last year we we just had the numbers come out. You know, China achieved uh, eight point one percent of uh, GDP growth of uh, 2022, uh, 2021. And uh, but of course, we 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 like to hear uh, uh, World Bank uh, uh, perspective and uh, forecast for China. So maybe I'll invite uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Martin. Razor, to give your uh, presentation, please. Uh, Martin, please. Thank you very much, uh, Henry. And it's good to be with uh, 
the Center for um, uh, uh, Global Development again, uh, CCG in, in China. It's a wonderful partnership. Um, I'm going to share my screen, but I'm not going to go through the entire presentation because I think uh, Ihan covered um, things quite comprehensively already. Uh, so um, the key messages that we, I would like to uh, emphasize for the case of China um, very much resonate some of the messages that Ihan talked about, only that the timing in the case of China is a little bit more advanced. So let me explain this. First, China's um, uh, efforts to control COVID-19 were quite successful early on. And this has been one of the factors that led China to recover uh, much more quickly than the rest, much of the rest of the world. Um, and we see this in the data um, with a large statistical rebound um, in GDP in the first half of 2021. <clears throat> and Ihan presented how the recovery from the COVID-19 recession in 2020 was a very, very sharp recovery, but how that recovery was also followed by a particularly sharp slowdown. And we see the same thing in the case of China, only that it already started in the second half of last year, where the economy started to slow down quite significantly. Now, when we look at some of the factors that contributed to the slowdown, I think um, uh, we see some differences to the global picture. First of all, in China, COVID remains largely uh, under control, but uh, the zero COVID policy has been put uh, to the test by the emergence of Delta and most recently the emergence of Omicron. While China has managed to contain uh, local outbreaks, their frequency has increased despite a high vaccination rate that China has achieved. Uh, and this has led to temporary uh, disruptions to supply, but also uh, has interrupted in particular the tourism sector and some other face-saving services, which is reflected uh, uh, in GDP and remains a risk to China's prospects going uh, forward. Um, now, on the uh, demand side, China has benefited a lot from the uh, very uh, significant stimulus that the advanced economies uh, enacted. And this has allowed um, China to sustain fairly high growth rates, even as domestic demand uh, um, already uh, started to uh, tail off in the second half of the year. And China has used the very strong statistical rebound to relaunch the risking efforts and to tighten financial regulations, particularly in the real estate sector, which um, has on the whole had a contractionary impact uh, on the economy in the second half of the year. So both fiscal policy and monetary policy have tightened um, at a time when global demand was very strong. And so the aggregate picture that you see in that 8.1% growth rate is really a combination of multiple factors. Um, number one, very, very strong statistical rebound in the first half of the year. Number two, sustained strong export performance, benefiting from the stimulus that was enacted in other countries. Uh, number three, um, uh, renewed uh, temporary COVID outbreaks that have led to some disruption, uh, both to domestic demand and to supply, uh, um, and have weighed on GDP growth. And number four, the tightening of uh, the policy framework and the de-risking policies uh, that have decelerated in particular investment demand. Now, going into 2022, this environment is likely to change. The statistical effects are no longer going to be in favor of growth, of course. The global environment is tightening significantly, as Ihan has pointed out. With the mutations in the virus, renewed out outbreaks uh, cannot be excluded, and China's zero COVID policy will require continued vigilance. And these outbreaks may weigh um, on, on growth. On the other hand, macroeconomic policy is expected to be loosened going into 2022, and we already see signs of that happening. However, the challenge for China is that if in the face of a generally less benign global environment, it loosens policy too much, 
it reignites some of the imbalances and some of the financial risks, both in the real estate sector and the local government debt, and more generally, uh, risks having seeing an increase in what the Chinese policymakers call the macro leverage ratio, essentially the share of credit to GDP, which is already very high. And so policy needs to be carefully calibrated to rebat to to on the one hand ensure that growth, uh, you know, stays close to potential. Uh, against the background of a difficult external environment. But on the other hand, that the sources of growth continue to rebalance to more sustainable long-term sources, including uh, a greater emphasis on consumption, a greater emphasis on services, and a greater emphasis on green industries. Uh, and that the driver economic growth shifts, that there is a handover from the dominant role of the public sector, which really led the initial part of the recovery to more private sector-led investment. And that requires structural reforms that increase the confidence of the private sector in the future um, of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of business prospects in the Chinese economy. So I have a whole set of, of, uh, of slides and numbers uh, to uh, in, the, in the presentation, but I think in a sense, um, I would limit my remarks to those key messages and briefly turn towards the end of the presentation uh, to our forecasts for this coming year um, and to the key uh, uh, policy suggestions that we derive from this. So you can see here uh, um, a different present, uh, representation of what Ihan was already talking about, uh, the, the slowdown in global growth in 2022. Um, and you can also see what we anticipate this would mean for China. Um, this is better uh, pictured in this slide here, where you can see that our growth forecast for China uh, next year is 5.1%. And that number is very close to what we see as the trend in potential growth. It's a little bit below potential growth, uh, but it's very close to China's potential growth rate. And you can see that in 2023, we basically expect a number that looks very similar to this. So really what's happening is that China is reconverging to potential growth. But what that also means is that in order to sustain growth, really China needs to emphasize reforms that enhance the economy's growth potential. And this is all the more the case because uh, there continue to be downside um, uh, risks from a cyclical perspective due to COVID, uh, due to global supply disruptions, due to tightening in global financial conditions. But there are also a number of significant longer term structural trend uh, uh, challenges that China faces. And this is uh, what I want to briefly turn to in my last uh, couple of slides before I, I close. Uh, the first is, uh, to um, uh, emphasize uh, the combination of structural and cyclical challenges uh, consisting in handling the pandemic, dealing with the property market slowdown, but also the following more long-term structural issues, stagnant productivity growth, more or less since 2013, uh, China's uh, total factor productivity has grown at very modest rates of around 1%. There's been a slight increase before the COVID pandemic in 2018, 2019, but productivity growth has basically been slow. Um, that's similar to most other countries in the world. Demographic headwinds, we're likely to see in 2022, the first year in which China's uh, population may not grow. Um, there are even reports that it may have declined in 2021, uh, but clearly the demographic transition in China is moving um, in a different direction than over the last uh, three decades. High levels of local debt, which mean that local governments have a difficult time uh, to stimulate the economy through additional um, uh, uh, local development pro uh, projects. Uh, it is also the case that China's physical capital stock has now reached the same level as the OECD countries. So and although China's per capita income is only uh, uh, slightly below a third of the OECD average, the amount of physical infrastructure per capita in the public sector in China is the same as the average in the OECD. And a lot of uh, uh, us are, 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 are in many ways impressed and grateful for the excellent transport infrastructure, the high-speed railway, for example, the airports, et cetera. But 
This also means that China's ability to stimulate the economy with more traditional infrastructure investment is more limited. New infrastructure is what will need to be identified, for instance, in the greening of the economy. But that is much more, uh, requires more policy coordination, requires more policy guidance than the traditional local development driven infrastructure investments uh, that we've seen in the past. Uh, the declining dynamism of firms, um, uh, concerns over uh, limits to competition, and growing inequality and slowing social and educational mobility. These are long-term challenges, many of which we outlined in detail in our joint study with the Development uh, Research uh, Center of the State Council, uh, the DRC, in our Innovative China report in 2019. So to, to, um, uh, 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 to summarize, achieving high quality growth requires a multidimensional rebalancing, rebalancing in terms of the composition of demand, from external to domestic demand, and from investment to industry-led growth, uh, from investment and industry-led growth to greater reliance on consumption and services. So this is the rebalancing that China has been trying to achieve and that a lot of the 14th five-year plan is about. The second, shifting from the significant weight placed on state leadership and regulation to a greater role for markets and the private sector. This is something that was announced in the 19th Party Congress, uh, a more decisive role for markets. Uh, this remains, in some sense, unfinished business and remains a key challenge, particularly in light of the slowing productivity growth that I mentioned earlier. And thirdly, transitioning and rebalancing from a high to a low carbon economy. And here it is worth emphasizing that what we saw in the first half of 2021 and the second half of 2020, so really in the 12 months between the middle of 2020 and 2021, was a very sharp economic rebound, but an even sharper rebound in emissions and in energy demand, because the rebound was driven a lot by traditional infrastructure investment, by real estate development. These require a lot of cement. These require a lot of steel. And these uh, uh, inputs require a lot of energy. Um, that was reflected um, in growing energy shortages in the middle of the year. It was also reflected in a very sharp increase in emissions. And so it's clear, both from a financial risk perspective, from a sustainability and productivity perspective, but also from a greening perspective, that these cannot be the sources of future Chinese growth. And really that the, the, the rebalancing that is required is required both uh, from a macroeconomic perspective, but also from a structural perspective to make growth more sustainable over the, over the medium and long term. And so uh, to summarize, uh, China has uh, been the first to bring the pandemic under control. It was the first economy to recover from the pandemic. We see this in a very strong performance in 2021. China has benefited additionally from the fact that other economies have put so much money into their stimulus. That has allowed China to be one of the first countries to recalibrate its policy mix, step off the gas, reduce the stimulus at home, and re-embark on structural reforms and de-risking policies. Going into 2022, the environment is less benign than it was last year. That means that China may need to relax policy a little bit, but fundamentally, we think China needs to continue its de-risking and structural reform agenda in order to make sure that growth over the medium term is both more sustainable, greener, and more inclusive. And so with that, let me stop and, and look forward to the questions uh, from the audience. Okay, great. Uh, uh, thank you, Martin. Actually, a uh, very stimulating discussion. I think you have also covered quite uh, uh, comprehensively uh, of what uh, uh, the growth actually China has achieved uh, uh, eight percent. I think you know World Bank forecast the China government announced about eight point one percent, which is uh, uh, quite close. I mean, you basically hit the mark. But also, uh, you forecast China twenty twenty two as five point one. You outline uh, so many uh, uh, you know opportunities, challenges, of course, also COVID challenges particularly, but also uh, the policy adjustments. So those are very valuable. Recommendations. I think we we we're going to uh, study uh, uh, very uh, you know detail uh, of those implications. Uh, 
now, uh, uh, you know, now I'm, I'd like to, you know, get into the discussion uh, uh, phase of, of uh, this, of our, uh, you know, webinar this morning. And the, what I would like to do, maybe I, I, I pose a, a few questions first, but then we will add some media question to that, uh, to, to, to just to, to start the discussion uh, now. So what I actually, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Kosa, you mentioned about, uh, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the widening uh, gap uh, uh of the of the you know the inequality and uh, so this is really actually th this is not reduced but even <laughs> getting worse during the uh, pandemic uh, uh, time so that really have a huge effect uh, uh, in the global economy uh, particularly for example in uh, uh, inequality kills the publisher uh, uh, just recently by uh, oxfam uh, says that world 10 reaches the man more than double their fortunes uh, from 700 billion to 1.5 trillion uh, at a rate of, uh, you know, uh, 15,000 uh, dollars per second or 1.3 trillion a day. So that's, 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 that's in, uh, enormous. And uh, so this two years of a pandemic actually has caused, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, this widening gap again. And, so, so how, how can we, you know, really address that? I mean, China, of course, now has started the common prosperity uh, initiative so that uh, we can try to contain in China just, uh, in the last 10 years, China has lifted the, the last part of the 100 million extreme poor uh, population. Of course, China also still facing that, that challenge as well. Uh, but I noticed that the world uh, uh, G20 has proposed this global corporate minimum tax of 15% so that uh, you know all the multinational all the, all the biggest uh, uh, richest people maybe need to you know get the money so there's one two issue one is a domestic policy how we can have a fair policy uh, adjustment so that uh, the bottom 50 get really benefit not not getting poor and poor uh, the other thing is that uh, if the if the richest has done something for the uh, for the uh, bottom 50 and uh, and also all the multinational, if this corporate minimum tax is in place, they will repatriate what they made overseas. So China would be maybe less become a scapegoat for for for, for problem that uh, other countries may have. So what what does the World, Th World Bank think about this? You know, this is one of the key issues I think that we have to address. Uh, otherwise, we'll get very tense geopolitical situations. Uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Kozi can. Give your opinion, or, or Dr. Uh, uh, Akena, <laughs> uh, 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 as well. Hey, Han, would you like to go, please? Yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, Henry. Uh, so uh, well, obviously, when we think about the pandemic uh, and the inequality, you nicely mentioned these. Uh, high-level stylized facts, inequality was a problem before the pandemic. Uh, because of the pandemic, uh, it's an even a bigger problem now. Uh, as I mentioned, we see higher inequality between countries and uh, higher inequality within countries. Uh, there are different ways of uh, cutting this data. You can look at the top 5%, uh, you can look at top 1%, versus the rest, uh, we have different cuts actually in the chapter. Um, the, the big challenge is that uh, because of the pandemic, we see an increase in many dimensions of inequality. So uh, this is a pandemic of inequality in a sense. Uh, when you think about availability of vaccines I mentioned, uh, when you think about uh, economic activity, there's a big difference between advanced economies, emerging developing economies, and emerging developing economies, in some cases, are not catching up anymore. They are actually decoupling. Uh, in access to education and healthcare, there's a big difference between those uh, they have the means and those they do not have the means. And in the scale of job and income losses, uh, which have been much higher in poorer segments of the society for women, for low-skilled employers, uh, and, uh, workers, and of course, of course, the you know the, the informal workers. Uh, and the big challenge for us, uh, this trend uh, we see in inequality, 
uh, has the potential to leave lasting scars. When you think about, for example, human capital losses, uh, primarily because of the disruptions uh, in access to education, uh, these uh, human capital losses can spill across uh, generations. Now you are asking this, uh, I think, a very pointed question. How can the kind of the global community uh, help? Um, the, the global community has a very important role. Uh, the, the, the basically uh, uh, richer countries uh, need to help uh, these countries. Uh, they are basically lagging, especially poorer countries. And in some cases, uh, the, the situation is obviously uh, quite uh, desperate. Uh, we are very pleased at the, at the bank with the latest uh, record uh, IDA replenishment. Uh, and we will use that replenishment with full uh, capacity of the institution uh, aggressively, intelligently, to make sure that low-income countries, IDA members, uh, take advantage of uh, the replenishment. We have a very strong work program, uh, along with, the, of course, the uh, financing program supported by the global community. We are thankful, uh, uh, but that's not enough. Uh, more is needed, and we are hopeful that uh, G20, G7 uh, will be more generous, uh, especially in some cases, we have food crisis in many countries, and, and we have a serious debt challenge that needs to be addressed. In, in the case of uh, the, the inequality, uh, global community can do certain things, but the national policymakers also need to act. And that starts with having a, a comprehensive uh, strategy. Um, and that strategy has uh, many uh, dimensions, uh, including uh, these uh, policy measures, the cyclical measures, uh, adjusting them uh, in a way that uh, you are able to utilize the, the, the levers uh, provided uh, to the public sector uh, in a way that uh, you are able to protect the most unfortunate segments of the society during downturns, uh, the translation of that having stronger social safety nets, uh, making sure that there is improved equality uh, when it comes to opportunity. And of course, uh, when we think about the kind of the broader uh, challenge, uh, finding ways to improve health uh, and education access to uh, larger segments of the society. And this shouldn't be just, you know, uh, having uh, a school building, making sure that the school building has the basic the teachers, not just having a hospital building, but that hospital building has the necessary health services. Um, I think uh, the bank around the world on the ground is trying to uh, overcome these challenges. Uh, by uh, no means these are easy to uh, address, uh, but given the kind of the, the increase in inequality, increase in poverty. We should worry about uh, social tensions brewing because of uh, these changes down the road and the consequences and the costs of uh, not addressing the inequality problem. Uh, but let me stop there uh, and ask uh, Martin. Uh, uh, Martin has uh, the country experience and ECA, of course, has the country experience as well. Uh, they might want to answer the question. Yeah. Just briefly on China, Henry, um, you're right that uh, China has um, very been very successful in poverty reduction. Um, we are working actually on a study that will soon come out with the Center for International uh, Knowledge and Development, CIKD, uh, that sort of summarizes the experience of that uh, poverty reduction. But the, the highlight figure is that most of the poverty reduction was due to China's extraordinarily fast economic growth. And that came from a, a, a very substantial uh, structural transformation of the economy from a largely agrarian to a heavily industrialized economy. So that, that I think is the key lesson. Now, over the last 10 years, China has also started to reduce 
in a limited uh, way, uh, economic uh, inequality and used social transfers to help the most vulnerable. Uh, and there are some lessons also to be learned from how China has um, managed to target those transfers. But as we find, one of the byproducts of the rapid social and economic transformation that China has gone through has been a dramatic increase in inequality. And this, together with the way that uh, the education system has organized, has led to declining levels of social mobility. So China does face some challenges going forward, despite of the success with poverty reduction, in ensuring that everybody has access to the same particularly educational opportunities, because those are the ones that will translate into job opportunities later on. And once again, I think China's experience can provide some very helpful lessons to other countries, because around the world, what we have seen is a significant increase in access. People are going to school, but persistent inequalities in learning, in learning outcomes. So people are going to school, but they're not coming out of the same knowledge within the same country, the same primary, the same secondary school doesn't necessarily offer the same quality of learning. So achieving more equality and access to quality education, I think is going to be one of the key challenges to deal with uh, the inequalities that we see. Not the only one, but I think China has a lot to offer here. And it's something that we are very much engaged to studying. Um, and uh, once that report is out, maybe we can also come back to you uh, for a, a separate discussion on it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Martin. I don't know, we'd love to, uh, to see your, your new report. And you're right, you know, uh, access to uh, education, job opportunities, probably are the next round of uh, uh, inequality that we have to tackle uh, here in China. Uh, but Martin, I'd like to follow up a question uh, uh, on your presentation as well. You, you mentioned about this uh, zero COVID test uh, policy that China has been adopting in the past uh, uh, two years uh, since pandemic. Of course, it seems uh, uh, quite uh, uh, successful, of course, as being the first economy to recover. And, uh, and also you see that uh, China's uh, uh, import export has hit the historical record high, reached uh, 6 trillion US dollars, uh, gone up 20% in 2021, according to the latest uh, uh, statistics. So, but, but that, that momentum, uh, that huge momentum, it seems going to probably going to slow down because uh, now we see the Omicron that uh, spread in the developed countries and, and U.S. has got uh, 60, 70 percent uh, vaccine and, uh, and also, you know, herd community probably reached in the developed countries. We see many countries probably are not practicing uh, zero uh, COVID policy like Singapore and, and countries like that. So what do you think about this, uh, you know, as 2022, 2023 comes up, other countries may already have a huge herd community where China may be due to the zero COVID become uh, vulnerable. And then, uh, you know, if, if also it continues to have a very tight uh, control, it's certainly going to impact the economy, tourism, you know, small SME and, 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 and people's livelihoods. So, so what do you think, how, how we can balance, what are the, what are the, what are the future, uh, you know, uh, optimal policy that uh, while we maintain the, certain level of a policy uh, intervention, but at the same time, we can open the economy as much as we can and how we can interface with the world because there's no international organization really doing something on coordinated international policy. WHO is not public enough. I don't know World Bank can do something, but we need really international guidance on how we can handle that. Right now is every country fighting by its own, but we don't know what is the maximum outcome for the world and for the country to revive if the Omicron probably signals the end of, uh, of this heavy pandemic. Perhaps <laughs> you, all of you can comment on this. Uh, how sure. we, where can we get an optimal point? Yes. I can kick off uh, with a few reflections on China's zero COVID policy, and then maybe Eka can say a word about global trade and, um, and uh, uh, you know, the impact uh, that the pandemic is, has on that. Uh, and Ihan can also uh, come in on that. But uh, look, China's China's zero COVID policy has been successful. However, it cannot be um, sustained forever. And the rest of the world basically, I think has decided that COVID will become endemic, that there will be no point where COVID disappears completely. Um, and uh, societies will learn to live with COVID just like we learn to live with the flu. 
the expectation is that improved vaccines and therapeutics will allow societies to deal with the health consequences of a pandemic such as COVID, just as the way we deal with the flu. That doesn't mean that there are zero flu cases. It doesn't mean that there are zero people dying from flu. There are hundreds of thousands of people dying annually from the flu. But it's not overwhelming our health systems. And I think that is, that is what endemic COVID means in the majority of other countries. And China will have to find an exit from its zero COVID policy if it wants to open its borders to these other countries, because the, 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 the virus will come in that way. Now, I think if you're just a brief remark on your question on the global coordination. I mean, as Ihan, I think, pointed out very clearly, uh, the top priority needs to be to increase vaccination rates uh, in, the, in the poorer countries, which initially suffered problems of access and now suffer that global production has actually reached a level where the world can be vac easily vaccinated with all the vaccines that are available, um, there, is a, the, there is a challenge of the deployment. So uh, vaccines are available, but how do we bring them to the poorer countries? And once the vaccines are procured, how do we make sure that those vaccines are deployed? I think that is the key global coordination issue, uh, making vaccines available and making sure they're deployed in those countries where vaccination rates are low. Uh, but for China, the key challenge, I think, is going to be to start planning the exit uh, from its current policy. And that needs careful preparation. That's not something that you want to do overnight. So uh, that I think is going to be a discussion over the coming months and year um, uh, in uh, specifically with respect to China. But over to uh, Eka and Ihan for any comments on, on global uh, supply chains and trade, etc. Yeah, thank you, Martin. And thank you, Henry, for asking this question. Uh, I think, as Martin said, it's a very complicated question. Ultimately, of course, it depends on country policy and choice. But I think I would look at it through two frameworks. One is what is the uh, risk for short-term growth and for long-term growth, and how it complicates country situation. Let's take China. We saw that China, before the pandemic, was rebalancing, trying to rebalance, right? From investment to consumption. And we know that the COVID has interrupted this rebalancing because it hit consumption. So when you take two years of consumption, you see this big hit and still negative. So this complicated rebalancing and it had its implications on the world and on world inflation, right? We know that reliance of China on industry, industrial production has increased commodity prices, which had the other implications for global inflation. So I'm just saying that it, if it lingers, if it continues the zero COVID strategy, it will make this complicated rebalancing and it will increase these different excesses that China has. The other prism I will look through is longer term. So in longer term, we know that China's big challenge and Martin showed, right, the potential growth, its driver, the productivity. Productivity very much depends on openness, right? Openness to ideas, on investment technologies, movement of people. So I think these are two big risks that I would look at. And as Martin said, it cannot be decided in one day. Clearly it depends on the readiness of the health system, the testing, the tracing, the gradual opening. But of course, it's a very complicated issue. And I'm sure with China team, we can look at this and have various right costs and benefit analysis and scenarios. Um, but I think it's a, it's a very serious concern, risk, and policy decision going forward. This is how I would put it. Thank you. OK, great. I think, yeah, uh, that's right. You know, so if, uh, if this, we can really manage this from a pandemic to ac epidemic, <laughs> you know, it's really uh, interesting to see. I mean, uh, uh, but I think it's important for, for uh, you know, all the countries, including China, probably, to now think about what's the exit strategy of this zero COVID-19. Uh, policy that uh, really, if the Western world and all the, you know, most of the countries are, are, are dropping that policy and then getting this, uh, uh, you know, herd community of the of Omicron and, uh, you know, while China is really has zero cases, uh, that will put China into a lot of constraints. So that will impact Chinese economy in the year ahead, the 2020 to 2023. So this is really uh, a, a, a new challenge. So, so so I hope that uh, we can really, I mean, the World Bank has really raised great this question. 
Now we are almost coming to the end. We, we have another uh, 10, 12 minutes, uh, but, but uh, you know, we're ready. I'm, according to my staff, we are, we are broadcast this on the 15 social platform. We had almost 200,000 <laughs> viewers online today. Uh, it, it's a busy morning time. So, so we have some collected some, uh, you know, media question as well. And uh, so the, the, the China Business News actually proposed a question. Uh, as economic growth slows down and the inflation rate remains high, will this eventually turn into a stagnation? Uh, will the factors lead to high inflation ease in 2022? That's uh, from China Business News. And then we have another one from uh, China News Agency. Uh, China has released the data for last year. Chinese economy has grown by 8.1%, and the economic aggregate volume has exceeded 110 trillion uh, Chinese yen. Uh, and uh, so how do you evaluate this performance of the Chinese economy uh, is, is steady growth? What role China play can play in the world uh, economic recovery? And also an, an, another news uh, from Red Star News, the, the, uh, the violent eruption of an underwater volcano in Tonga has spread a shock wave around half of the world. It highlights the threat of climate change. How will such cl climate disaster like Tonga affect the global economy? Those, those, those uh, you know, uh, surprises, uh, black swans event, you know. So, so those are three questions that we, we selected from the media. Perhaps we can give a final round of uh, uh, answer from all of you. Uh, Arhan, perhaps you can start. Uh, thank you, Henry. Let me briefly talk about the inflation question. I think uh, given that we are really spending a lot of time thinking about uh, this issue nowadays, uh, inflation is a problem and it's a problem everywhere. Uh, as I showed uh, the, the, in, in, the, in, the, in the presentation, uh, when you look at uh, inflationary dynamics, as long as these dynamics are under control in the sense that for inflation targeting economies, they are below target. Uh, you can say uh, uh, maybe uh, this is not an issue, but inflation uh, is already above central bank target ranges in over half of inflation targeting emerging market developing economies. Uh, and when you think about the impact of inflation, uh, rising inflation hits uh, low-income workers particularly hard. Uh, food prices have risen significantly. We have a food crisis uh, in, in uh, a number of uh, low-income countries. Uh, a third of emerging developing economies experienced uh, double-digit food inflation last year. So it's not just general uh, price pressures uh, for uh, the bank uh, focusing on uh, developing economies. Uh, we are looking at these disaggregate uh, price pressures as well. And these pressures constitute a significant challenge. On the one hand, growth is slowing. On the other hand, uh, many emerging developing economies are withdrawing uh, policy support, as I mentioned during the presentation, uh, partly because of to contain these inflationary uh, pressures. Uh, in addition, uh, because of high debt and deficits and rising financing costs, uh, the majority of them uh, uh, is reducing uh, fiscal support measures while uh, withdrawing monetary policy support. Uh, since they do not have the policy space, they are resorting these uh, contractionary policy measures well before the recovery is complete. Now, in our baseline scenario, there is no stagflation. However, uh, we have the possibility of a steeper downturn, which we call hard landing, that could be driven by inflationary pressures larger than we are expecting now. And of course, those pressures will come a much faster tightening cycle with 
serious implications for emerging market developing economies. Uh, these pressures in advanced economies uh, have uh, significant implications for emerging developing economies. Uh, as the US Fed uh, is tapering its asset purchases and getting ready to increase interest rates uh, because of much higher than expected inflation readings, uh, global financial conditions will likely tighten. And this will affect emerging developing economies uh, with uh, uh, elevated debt levels and large uh, debt roll rollover obligations. I think uh, any time when you have a normalization cycle, and this will be the first really true normalization cycle because of these inflationary pressures uh, we are experiencing probably over the past two decades, uh, we should be ready for accidents happening and, and bumps on the road. And policy makers need to think about uh, calibrating their policies, making sure policies are credible, and ultimately uh, making sure that they are able to flexibly approach uh, changes in advanced economy policies by putting in place uh, domestic measures. And that starts with having strong macro policy frameworks. Uh, about the question uh, with respect to uh, Tonga, uh, that's another uh, example why it is so critical to be ready for crisis. Preparation uh, is uh, always uh, cheaper than response. Uh, the preparation and prevention are critical dimensions of uh, getting ready to these types of unfortunate events. Uh, we discussed these issues actually uh, at the uh, annual meetings and, and at a uh, conversation with the, our membership about how we can think about uh, crisis preparation. And um, obviously, with the climate change related uh disasters we need to be even uh more proactive uh, in terms of getting ready uh, to these types of events but let me stop there uh, henry thank you okay thank you thank you uh yeah so martin you or uh, 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 canon uh, uh, um i think there's only the question uh remaining on china's economic performance in 2021 on which i said quite a few words in my intervention, but just to, uh, you know, uh, uh, repeat uh, and summarize, uh, China's performance in 2021 was, uh, was very solid, uh, but it reflects, uh, to some extent, the depth of the decline in the first half of 2020. And so in the first half of 2021, you saw a large rebound, and that carried over into the high growth rate of 8.1% that we saw at the end of the year. When you look at the second half of the year, where that statistical effect was no longer present, you see that growth was slowing quite sharply uh, to 4.9% of the third quarter and to 4% uh, or four, slightly above 4% in the fourth quarter. Um, and so that's more likely to be um, the outlook going into next year, uh, that growth is now declining uh, towards its uh, potential um, uh, and uh, that in the context of a difficult global environment, uh, policymakers need to be flexible, just as Ihan pointed out. But most importantly, policy needs to remember that the key challenges for China uh, really are how to uh, ensure sustained um, uh, growth over the medium term how to rekindle productivity growth, uh, how to ensure the private sector drives uh, uh, economic growth, how to ensure that growth is consistent uh, with reductions in inequality and uh, with a greener um, uh, uh, and lower carbon footprint. And so th those are really the challenges that China faces. It's going to be a difficult year to, in 2022, but 2021 was pretty good. Uh, and so China can uh, enter uh, next year with uh, some level of confidence. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And uh, so does uh, uh, Catherine have anything to add? Yes, I just wanted to add a couple of words on the disaster, natural disaster, which we saw recently in Tonga. 
So there are two aspects. Uh, one is for the world, and as Ihan alluded more to the climate risk for the world is one of the prominent risks. But also I want to talk about the region a little bit. I want to say that in this crisis, we know that small island economies were disproportionately hit and they will be hit and this uh, difficulty will remain with them over the next period. Why? Because although the goods trade has recovered, the tourism may remain subdued over the next couple of years, right? And so that is already a challenge for small island economies. Uh, we have, and I think we, in our report, we look at per capita growth that has been convergence, as you know, between developing countries and advanced economies. And island economies is one group of countries where actually growth diverges now from advanced economies. And we calculate that in East Asia, it's about 2% divergence in income from advanced economies in the pace of growth because of the pandemic. So you add to that the disaster, which is now we are seeing, and also the JEP shows that for small island economies, the climate risk is already uh, trimming around one, almost one percentage point over the past two decades. So that is just to show how huge is the climate risk and how we see damaging these countries. And again, this we see small countries, maybe they are so far not so important for the global, but the costs are rising and the revenue is dropping. And this is becoming one of the perhaps in addition to pandemic, very, very important risk. And uh, the solution is in hands of large countries uh, and the victims are so far the tiniest, the smallest countries. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, thank you. So uh, we, we're almost coming to the end of uh, 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 you know, this special edition of World Bank uh, uh, you know, 2022 Global Economic Prospect. Uh, a launching event in China uh, with CCG. So, so I think we have covered quite a range of issues as uh, we, we last uh, hear uh, from you, you know, see the, this, the risk, of course, there's a, we're having the pandemic, we're having the climate change, but also, you know, we, we should try to avoid geopolitical risk as well. I mean, you know, let's, let's really focusing on the, on the global economy and, uh, and also the growth and also the policy adjustment and, and let's the, World Bank, you know, all the uh, multilateral agencies work together with the, uh, you know, different uh, regions and the government and, and let's secure the, uh, uh, you know, pr common prosperity continuously, uh, try to avoid all the challenges and, uh, and particularly the risk we just mentioned. So, so, so once again, I want to thank uh, uh, all of you for this uh, really joining this uh, CCG special a global dialogue series we had a uh, you know for the last year and a half we had launched uh, uh, over you know 20 to 30 uh, global dialogue events with many well-known think tanks and we had a few time with the world bank so i'm really uh, thankful for that and also i would like to uh, say that we would like to continue the uh, cooperation with world bank and we hope that uh, you know with uh, this uh, uh, you know uh, continuous cooperation we can really provide more uh, accurate uh, more uh, uh, information for the decision makers, policy community, academic business community here in China and, and around the world. So, so once again, I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Arhan Kosi, uh, you know, director of a global economic prospect of a World Bank, uh, Dr. Martin uh, Razor, the country director for China and Mongolia and Korea of, of World Bank, and also. Uh, Dr. Akena uh, Vashamada, the <laughs> senior economist of the country for the World Bank. So, so on behalf of uh, CCG, also I'd like to thank also our audience. We have almost 200,000 viewers uh, this morning and uh, from China around the world and through our 15 uh, uh, social media platforms and including CCG. So, so once again, I, uh, we hope you have a, a nice evening and also <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, days uh, as Chinese New Year is coming. May I wish you a, a prosperous Chinese New Year of Tiger, and uh, hope to see you again in next six months when your new pod comes out. Thank you and uh, goodbye. Okay, bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank our audience as well. Thank you. Yeah, wishing all the audience a very happy year of the tiger. Have a wonderful spring festival.